Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, today I am looking at a person in history who has, depending on where you live, influenced your life almost more than anyone else, but whose name you almost definitely don't know, unless you go to George Mason University. That is George Mason, one of the members of the founding generation who had a major role in writing some of the major documents, creating the entire U.S. government. For example, the Declaration of Independence wasn't originally Thomas Jefferson's idea. He adapted it directly from Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights. And James Madison, the supposed father of the Bill of Rights, opposed their addition to the Constitution while Mason avidly insisted on it. Now, he was so dedicated to defending individual freedoms that he refused to sign the U.S. Constitution, arguing it didn't adequately uphold them. To flesh these issues out, I'm speaking with William Highland, author of the new book, George Mason, the Founding Father Who Gave Us the Bill of Rights. Well, there's many reasons that Mason wasn't remembered. He wasn't a public person. He was very private. Part of the reason, he was a widower with 12 children, nine who survived into adulthood. And by personality, he was a disinterested and impersonal figure. He also had a complex view of slavery. Over time, he wanted it to be abolished through a sunset clause, but himself personally owned slaves, similar to Thomas Jefferson's view that slavery was like holding a wolf by the ears. You can't hold on to him, but you dare not let him go. So he was a complex figure, but his opinions have direct bearing on the American understanding of free speech and personal liberty. I hope you enjoyed this discussion with William Highland. William, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk a lot about George Mason, something that I think comes up a lot with founding fathers who aren't part of the pantheon of the well-known ones, the Thomas Jeffersons, Benjamin Franklins, and others, is the question of why this or that founding father isn't remembered in the same way. Names like John Dickinson or Francis Marion or Richard Henry Lee or others don't come up as much. For better or for worse, George Mason seems to fall in that crowd. So Why do you think George Mason isn't part of the collection of the well-known founding fathers that every middle schooler could at least name or recognize? Well, you know, he was a very uh, private man, unlike uh, Washington, Madison, and Jefferson, who had a very public career. He was a very private man. His wife died at a very young age, at 39, and he had to raise nine children uh, by himself. And he preferred his really cloistered world um, with his books, his farm, and his family at Gunston Hall. So he really was a reluctant patriot to go into the public limelight. But he does not get uh, enough credit, in my opinion, for some of the most famous founding documents in our history. Um, Really, he coined the term life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness about a month before Jefferson even wrote the Declaration of Independence, those were Mason's words. His Virginia Declaration of Rights, written in 1776, was really the blueprint and the uh, precursor for the first 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights that were written uh, in 1787, about 12 years after he put those Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, down on paper. So I don't think he was really a public man, a public, um, certainly not a president like Washington, Madison, and Jefferson. So he was very, very private. And that's why I don't think he's got his due credit uh, over history. Right. He was the sort of the scholar farmer, even more so than Jefferson would be. And uh, I have to ask before getting more into constitutional theory that he had, being a widower with nine kids... Was that happening as he was helping craft the Bill of Rights, as he was involved in Virginia politics? Where does this happen in his political career? Yeah, it was all happening during the most tumultuous years of the Revolution and um, 12 years later when he went to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. So he was uh, a widower you know, at that time, uh, and again, his wife died at the age of 39, so he He and his wife actually had 12 children, but only nine of them lived to adulthood. So he certainly preferred and wanted to be with his children 
at the time, but he felt a sense of duty, a sense of patriotism to go to the Virginia Convention in 1776. Well, uh, can you tell me about his role in crafting the Bill of Rights? What made him come to this particular position? There was much disagreement amongst the founding fathers, a Hamiltonian view versus a Jeffersonian view. He falls more in the Jeffersonian camp. What in his education, what in his experiences do you think made him arrive at his understanding and position on how the American government should be set up? Well, you know, he did not have any formal education, unlike Madison and Jefferson, who both went to college and law school. He was uh, self-taught by his uncle, John Mercer, and John Mercer had one of the best libraries in Virginia, over 1,700 volumes of uh, English law, English jurists like uh, Montesquieu, Locke, Rousseau. So he was really, Mason was self-taught um, in English jurists and constitutional theory. But he was a, a big believer, and this was his dominant, really, idea that natural rights were given to mankind, and those natural rights were individual liberty. In fact, he wrote in the Virginia Declaration of Rights that all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people. So he read all of this English um, law, the English Bill of Rights, the Magna Carta, and he was a huge believer in individual freedoms, individual rights, which were natural and inherent rights. What he's writing in the Virginia Declaration of Rights and other documents and the Virginia Constitution is a lot of it from his own study that he puts together independently as his own political theory, or does some of it come in reaction to the coercive acts of 1774 or other things that are happening politically? Some of it is from his own writing, but some of it is certainly he was influenced by the English jurists. The uh, English Bill of Rights, I think, in 1689, the Magna Carta. But he was a strong believer that government was instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, and not vice versa. And you know, at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he was one of only three men who did not sign the Constitution because it did not have a Bill of Rights attached to it. And that's how he's kind of been remembered in history as one of the few men who did not sign the Constitution. But it was really his Virginia Declaration of Rights that about two years later was almost adopted verbatim um, by Madison uh, to become our Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. What did the Constitution lack that prevented him from signing, and what do you think if would have made him sign it if it had been added to the Constitution? Um, he wrote, you know, thirteen specific objections to the Constitution, why he did not sign it. The first two uh, objections were one, there was no formal Bill of Rights attached to the Constitution. Both Madison and Washington were against a formal Declaration of Rights because they thought it was superfluous, that anything not in the Constitution was left to the states. But Mason wanted a document. He wanted the spelling out of those rights, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and that was not attached to the final document that was signed in Philadelphia. But his second objection was that the Constitution sustained slavery, the importation of slaves for the next 20 years, and he was absolutely against that. So those were the two main reasons he did not sign the Constitution in Philadelphia. What was his position on slavery? I forget if he was against the institution but owned them or an abolitionist. I get that confused with different founding fathers. Where was he on that? You know, he called slavery a, a slow poison, and he was a slave owner. But again, he did come up with a plan for the eventual emancipation of slaves, but he just could not figure out in his writings and his thoughts how they could uh, end slavery in their lifetime. He basically thought that it was going to be the next generation 
that would have to end slavery, but he was very, very anti-slavery, um, even though he was a slave owner. But again, one of the main objections he had to the Constitution was that it sustained slavery for the next 20 years. Was he similar to Jefferson? I think Jefferson had that quote that slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. You cannot, um, you are in danger of either holding him or letting him loose. Was he similar to that position or something different? Very similar. You know, they they depended on slavery, uh, obviously, for their plantations, for their farms, um, for their economy. But in Virginia at the time, if they had freed slaves, there was a law that stated that the slave had to move out of the state within one year. And that's one of the reasons Jefferson did not free his slaves or Mason, that he wanted, he knew that the slave families uh, on the farms were intact families and they would have to move out of the state. They would be compelled to move out of the state if they were freed. But he certainly struggled with that issue um, and he did come up with a plan but he just did not think it was viable in his lifetime. Right. I think I read somewhere that he favored manumission, but wanted slaves to be properly educated so that they could thrive in society beforehand, which th- and there's a whole cart and the horse issue there. I-, I could see the complications. But yeah, I think that points to the-, the complexity of this issue at the time that they're arguing. It was very complex. And in and- both of uh, Jefferson and Mason's uh, ideas kind of evolved over time uh, on slavery, but they both struggled with how to end slavery and how to reconcile that with, you know, the freedoms. Every man is um, born equal and free. Well, something that I think makes Mason very relevant today as a historical figure, perhaps more so, is his understanding of constitutional rights. Since there's an entire school of legal theory and even Supreme Court justices who believe that constitutional law is interpreted as the framers would have understand it. This is very unique historically. By analogy, there's not that many military strategists who think we must do things as Napoleon would have originally envisioned it. And that is how we must tack. That's how it's done. But originalists, I mean, that that is a theory that this is something that is active and this is what our constitutional foundations are built upon. So that's what makes George Mason really relevant. I'd like to dig into your thinking um, as you're examining his life and his own political theory. What individual rights do you think that were most important for him and he would probably agree or disagree with most strongly today and how it's interpreted? Well, you know, he wrote in the Virginia Declaration of Rights um, that freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty. So he really believed in a free press, free expression. He also wrote free exercise of religion in his Virginia Declaration of Rights. And again, this document was written 12 years before the Constitution and the formal Bill of Rights. So he believed in freedom of expression, individual liberties, individual rights. But he also, you know, one of his first statements in the Declaration of Rights is that all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people. So he was very much what was called an anti-federalist, whereas Washington and Madison believed in a strong federal centralized government. Jefferson and Mason believed in a very restrained, smaller government and more power to the people and on individual liberties. Later on in his life, as the constitutional system in the United States takes shape and there is later on an increased power in the federal government, what's Mason's reaction to these developments as far as you know? He was um, really shocked, and he actually campaigned against the Constitution um, after 1787. Virginia had their own ratifying convention. The uh, Constitution had to be ratified by nine out of the 12 states at the time, and he, Mason, and Patrick Henry led the campaign against ratifying the Constitution, mainly because there was no Bill of Rights attached to the Constitution. 
that was their clarion call that there had to be a bill of rights had to be the these first 10 amendments that he expressed 12 years earlier in his declaration of rights so virginia actually did 